burning something to boil water to create steam is a really old-fashioned technology. It was developed in the 18th century, and it's and it's just a really out-of-date technology. I mean, you, you think of what it takes to dig up those massive amounts of coal or or um, drill for all of that gas and pipe it in and then burn it to boil water or drive turbines directly. It's the sort of thing you wouldn't do if you didn't absolutely have to do it. One for mum, one for dad, one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be in Australia. Dead, buried, cremated. Australia's basically done for. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. Good day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast demystifying the big economic issues in Australia and putting them in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director of the Australia Institute. Melbourne, it's hot, hot, hot out here. Our top forecast today is 44 degrees. Welcome to summer 2018. Certainly going to be even hotter tomorrow. It's a scorching day across Victoria with temperatures reaching 40 degrees. Temperatures across Western Sydney tomorrow to be in excess of 40 degrees. It is the vulnerable in our community who in actual fact die as a result of this heat. Heat kills. There's a bushfire burning. Fire authorities were busy too, dealing with around 100 small grass fires across the state. The hills around Gary Beach looked more like a volcanic eruption than a bushfire. We've just smashed the record for the hottest five-year period globally. And while we were all sweltering, you may have missed this little news story. Well, Tesla's enormous battery in South Australia is just weeks old, but it's already responding to power outages in record time. Since it was switched on in December, the world's largest lithium-ion battery has smoothed over at least Two major drops in electricity output. The brand new Tesla battery in South Australia spent its first month of operation showing off how quickly it can swoop in. We're talking milliseconds here. To support the grid when Loy Yang Coal Power Station in Victoria's La Trobe Valley tripped and lost power just before Christmas. And this uh, big battery, uh, the biggest in the world, is already proving its value. As you said, being able to switch into gear within 0.14 of a second supplying stability to the grid. And it's doing much better than our old coal and gas power fleet, which increasingly fails at summer when we most need it. Tesla injected a small amount of electricity into the grid, but enough to prevent any blackouts and enough to prove the world's biggest lithium battery system, which was built within 100 days, actually works. The story was picked up by the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times and the Australia Institute's director Ben Oquist went on Australian TV news to talk about this early success. I think we're going to see it in other places. It's not just Tesla. AES is building um, batteries in South Australia. We've got the Victorian government moving ahead with 100 megawatts in that state. Uh, There's a project already underway in uh, Queensland. Some estimates say that we'll have about 800 megawatts of uh, utility battery storage by the end of 2018 after the success of 2017. Mums and dads are also getting involved. Some 17,500 householders have already got batteries in their household. Bloomberg New Energy Finance thinks we might be at 80,000 megawatts sometime in the future of battery storage in Australia. Wow. It, it, it's, a, it's a big part of, of a modern, reliable energy grid that matches beautifully with renewables. Well, certainly looks to have been a savvy decision at this stage by the South Australian government. Elon Musk to the rescue, perhaps. Ben O'Quist from the Australian Institute, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And it wasn't just Loy Yang A coal-fired power station that failed this summer. I think in the last three days we've had four you know, substantial size units trip across the national electricity market. And I would, I'd say it's probably, you know, three or four times a week on average. That's Mark Ogue, Principal Advisor at the Australian Institute, speaking from Melbourne. He's just written a report on the reliability of Australia's ageing gas and coal fleet called Can't Take the Heat which found that 14% of gas and coal generation failed when we needed them most during the February 2017 heatwave. The Australia Institute is now tracking whenever a gas or coal-fired power plant breaks down or drops out, losing hundreds of megawatts of electricity from the grid with a new gas and coal watch that you can find on our website. We'll put a link to the tracker in the podcast show notes. Mark says power stations have been dropping out all over the country this summer while we've all been watching the cricket. Yeah, so essentially we get notified every time a unit at a at a coal or gas plant breaks down. So we're only notified when the 
power basically drops off to zero, you know, in the space of a, of a few minutes. So that means that the plant's actually broken down. So we can actually track how many breakdowns uh, we're getting on a, on a day-by-day basis. I, I guess the, it really came to a crunch in the heat wave in February last year when we had a huge amount of coal and gas plants fail right at the critical moment of, of those heat waves when we hit peak demand. So across the whole national electricity market, we had a failure of 14% of coal and gas plants uh, in, over, in those three states um, at the critical moment of peak demand. And in fact, 20% in New South Wales. So 20% in New South Wales alone. Yeah, 20% in New South Wales alone. It's 20% of all the coal and gas plant capacity. And it was right at the moment that you had peak demand on the heat wave day, day of February the 10th. So it was a huge failure and it, it resulted in the Tamago aluminium plant having to be uh, shut down because there wasn't enough power to go around. So it had pretty big consequences and would have had much bigger consequences as we'll probably discuss later if we hadn't had solar performing really well on that day. If that smelter couldn't have shut down, would New South Wales have been looking at blackouts? Uh, yes, because the the national electricity market has a deal with Tamago and they pay um, lesser rates, but it means that they can they can have their load shed, so they will forfeit their supply of electricity under certain circumstances uh, if they need to. So had we not had load shedding at Tamago, then somebody would have had to have gone without electricity and that could have been other other industries or, um, you know, businesses and households. So let's start with the problem of heat waves, I guess, because that seems to be when they're failing. Uh, I don't think with global warming they're going to be dropping off in number or frequency anytime soon. Is that right? Yeah, so we're looking at a really big increase in heat waves over time. So already over the last 15 years in particular, we've had a, a really big increase in the amount of uh, extreme heat days and heat waves, and that's projected to basically just keep increasing. And it's those extreme heat wave days that are the real challenge in supplying electricity because everybody, when the temperatures get uh, really high like that, everybody needs to cool their houses, which is really important for people's health. And so they turn their air conditioners on and that um, causes really high demand that the electricity system struggles to cope with. So not only are we going to be experiencing more intense and more frequent heat waves, but right at the moment when everyone needs them the most, we're seeing gas and coal-fired power plants really either not performing at 100% or indeed sometimes tripping and breaking down. Before we get into that, why is it that these types of plants are vulnerable to the heat? What what you've got to remember is that these plants weren't designed for this kind of heat. So, you know, they were designed before global warming and you had, you you know, you had a lot less of these heat waves and extreme heat days. And I guess people should remember they're they're not young plants in many cases, they're ageing plants. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's actually a number of issues. One is that they weren't designed for these conditions. Another is that a lot of them are actually getting really old and like anything that gets really old, it, um, like a car or something like that, it breaks down more over time. So we've got a very old fleet of coal plants in particular and some of the gas plants and as you would expect when they're running past, past the amount of time that they were designed to run, they just break down more and more often and you're seeing that in particular with the Victorian brown coal plants and some of and some of the, the, the very old New South Wales uh, black coal plants. But another really big issue is just their size because so they, they're usually made up of a number of generating u- units or that each have their own turbine and they're often several hundred megawatts in size. So if one of those breaks down, it has a huge impact on the grid because you lose that amount of power instantaneously. And of course, the grid needs to supply the exact amount of electricity that's needed at any given moment. So if you suddenly have 450 megawatts suddenly disappearing unexpectedly from the power supply, that's really difficult 
for the grid to cope with and can actually mean that we end up, you know, having less power than we actually need. And So the bigger they are, the harder they fall, more or less. Exactly. And breakdowns of that size are happening all the time. These hulking great lumps of steel and concrete need cooling down. And it's not just the older power stations that are breaking down on hot days. Kogan Creek is Australia's second newest coal-fired power plant. It's broken down twice in January, taking 700 megawatts of power off the grid. Kogan Creek is one of Australia's few supercritical coal-fired power plants. You know, those ultra-supercritical expialidocious plants that the Minerals Council talks up constantly. Australian coal is very high energy, so it improves their efficiencies of the power station and lowers emissions. It turns out they're not so super in the heat after all. And, and they have to use a lot more power to cool when the temperature is really high. And because they're using a lot more power, it reduces the output in power. And at the same time, it makes them more likely to break down as well. So they're not operating at 100% and they're much more likely to break down whenever it gets super hot, which it's going to do more and more frequently. Is that a, a fair summary? That's exactly right. I think one thing I'd add, though, is that, you know, what we're talking about here is actually 19th century technology. Like burning something to boil water to create steam is a really <laughs> uh, old-fashioned technology. Actually, it was developed in the 18th century, and it's, and it's just a really kind of out-of-date technology. I mean, you, you think of what it takes to dig up those massive amounts of coal or, or um, drill for all of that gas and pipe it in and then burn it to boil water or, or drive turbines directly. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, the sort of thing you wouldn't do if you didn't absolutely have to do it. So it's really last century's technology or even the, the century before. And now we've just designed really much more efficient ways to, to create electricity with uh, wind and solar and batteries and that kind of thing. Yeah, Richard Dennis, as uh, an economist like everyone knows, is quite offended <laughs> by that, uh, that method of producing electricity. The biggest use of electricity in Australian households is heating water. And the most common way to heat water is via an off-peak hot water system. Now, how do we heat that up? Well, first we dig up some coal, transport it to a coal-fired power station, burn the coal, use the heat from the coal to turn water into steam. The steam spins a turbine, the turbine uh, spins magnets inside a wire coil, and we've got electricity. We've lost about half of the energy in that process. Then we send the electricity hundreds of kilometres along copper wire networks, losing 10 to 15% along the way. The electricity comes into your off-peak hot water system and it heats half a tonne of water up to a temperature that's just hot enough to burn your children and not hot <laughs> enough to have a cup of tea with. And then when you step into the shower in the morning, you turn the hot tap on and you go, oh, shit, that's hot, and you add cold to it. <laughs> It is almost inconceivable that you could come up with a less efficient way to heat water. <laughs> and that's the point. These things were invented to soak up base load supply. Yeah. At four o'clock in the morning, that's what the electricity is doing. Heating huge quantities of water to the wrong temperature. Does that offend you as an economist, Richard? It offends me in so many ways. <laughs> it, you couldn't get a less efficient battery. <laughs> it's shocked me a little really how frequent it is. I mean, these these are baseload plants that we've been sold for many years um, by, you know, oftentimes both sides of politics talking about how reliable these are and to find that they're tripping so often, I, I just don't think anyone is really aware of how frequently it happens. Yeah, it's 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 kind of ridiculous to sell them to sell them as reliable and baseload plants. And I think a classic example is the there's these two state-of-the-art, brand new or relatively brand new, they're about nine years old, combined cycle gas plants in New South Wales, Talawarra and Kalongra, and together they're about 1,000 megawatts. So they're a really big chunk of the New South Wales grid. And if any plant is meant to be reliable and baseload and able to supply energy, you know, at any time it's needed, it would be these two pretty much brand new combined cycle gas plants. And yet on the heatwave day on the 10th of February last year, about eight minutes before the peak demand moment where everything collapsed, the Talawarra gas plant just suddenly stopped working. And then they tried to start the Kalongra gas plant and that didn't work either. 
So a thousand megawatts was unavailable, and these are the these are the supposed to be the ultimate in reliable and responsive plants. Since then, just in the last month, the Telawarra plant has broken down twice. So it's broken down to you know to the point of not being able to supply energy any energy at all twice just in the last month. So that kind of gives you an example of just how unreliable a lot of these plants are. So what type of new technology can handle the heat and is best suited to meet the peak demand in electricity? You know, when everyone comes home from school and work and turns on the air conditioning, the TV and starts cooking dinner all at once. Well, Mark argues it's not the big gas and coal-fired power stations that win on cost or baseload reliability. There's always a peak every day because at some point, you know, the electricity demand reaches its highest point. But the really problematic times are extremely hot days now because of because of air conditioning. So um, it's the extreme heat days in summer that are the, the days that the grid has trouble supplying that electricity. And what role does solar play on days like that? Well, solar basically has, has saved saved us from having you know, really serious blackouts. So what it does is because people are getting their electricity from the solar panels on their roof rather than having to draw it from the grid, which is already stretched on these really, really hot days, it reduces underlying demand. So you you have much less demand than you would otherwise have because people are getting that power from their solar panels. So what that does is it reduces peak demand or reduces the peak demand that you would have had without solar and, and often by significant amounts. You know, we're talking 500 megawatts or, or more often. Um, but really importantly, what it does is it delays those peak demand moments. And so what that means is that the point, that point of reaching the peak demand that is often the moment that causes these uh, blackouts and load shedding and that kind of thing can be delayed by typically by several hours by people using solar from their solar panels. So in that in that huge heat wave in February last year in South Australia, New South Wales and Queensland, uh, in, in all of those states, solar PV delayed peak demand by several hours. And, it, and it's not uncommon for solar PV to delay peak demand by you know, six, eight, even nine hours. And so what's the impact of that? Why is why is that important? In those heat wave situations, if we had reached that peak demand uh, moment, the, the moment at which you had that load shedding and blackouts and, you know, high price events and all of those consequences, if that had happened five hours earlier, so say at midday instead of 5 p.m., then the consequences would have been huge because you you reach that crisis point at midday and then demand continues to go up. And so it would have uh, almost certainly resolved in really quite dramatic and you know dangerous blackouts uh, in all three of those states. The National Energy Guarantee, it is a credible, workable, pro-market policy that delivers lower power prices and a more reliable system. We call on Labor to get off their their reckless, job-destroying agenda to push renewables into the market without any regard to the consequences. Get on board with the right plan recommended by the smartest people. In the Australia Institute's report, Can't Take the Heat, Mark calls for the National Energy Guarantee to guarantee that there's a heat-safe backup for gas and coal-fired power plants because these unreliable clunkers fail in the heat. If the government doesn't include this, you could conclude that the guarantee is really designed more to hobble the renewable energy industry than it is to guarantee the least cost, most reliable, low emissions electricity grid. Luckily, the states are going it alone. South Australia is building a 150 megawatt solar thermal power plant that can store and dispatch over 100 megawatts at full output for eight hours. Its dispatchable energy is two-thirds the price of the gas peaking plants it competes against, and it produces bulk energy during the day. The Victorian government and ACT government also have plans to build their own battery systems, which is looking extremely sensible. So what, what the National Energy Guarantee says is that the energy retailers have to buy a certain amount of energy from what they define as um, dispatchable sources 
if they're using variable sources like wind and solar, then they have to have dispatchable sources to make sure that there's a reliable energy supply because wind and solar obviously vary, you know, depending on how much the wind is blowing or, or whether it's sunny or not. Now, those dispatchable sources, the government doesn't really define what those are, but they have said it includes coal plants and gas plants, but it could equally include solar thermal power with storage because solar thermal power, you know, can run 24-7 and it's dispatchable. Um, You know, it's very responsive. It can supply power as you need it and, and it could also include batteries. So it could include a number of things. So like the Tesla big battery that we've seen really being able to kick in in fractions of a second when we have those trips that we've been monitoring at gas and coal plants. Yeah, that would be an example of dispatchable energy and and so would solar thermal, which is actually can produce much larger amounts of energy and is you can dispatch very quickly as well, like like the solar thermal plant they're building in South Australia or they're about to start building in South Australia. Mm -hmm. There's no equivalent though um, for that type of guarantee for gas and coal, basically because they're not seen as unreliable? Well, the the implication of it is that, you know, gas plants and coal plants could provide that that dispatchable energy, you know, to provide that reliability. And it's kind of a strange one because coal plants seem to have been rebranded as dispatchable energy, which is a bit of a strange thing because dispatchable energy is usually something that can be dispatched at short notice, whereas coal plants are very expensive to kind of ramp up and ramp down and they, they take ages, etc. So so there's kind of a bit of a strange... Um, so they've got the PR companies out and they've, <laughs> they've re- rebranded, but that's not essentially what coal-fired power is. It's not really dispatchable. It's not usually how, you know, how coal plants are understood to operate. But anyway, so that seems to have, have changed in, in very recent times, um, you know, in the minds of some policymakers anyway. But the real issue is that given how unreliable these plants are proving to be, particularly in heat waves, it seems strange to have them as backing up variable renewable energy. So, for instance, that Talawara plant that I was talking about before in New South Wales that has failed completely twice in the last month and failed right at the peak of the the February 10th heat wave last year in New South Wales. So how can you have a plant like that, which is meant to be the ultimate in gas as dispatchable energy, how can you have plants like that that have shown themselves to break down uh, frequently, including at the absolute critical time when they're needed? Um, how can you have those plants backing up the energy security of the grid. It just really doesn't make sense. Mm. So one thing that we've suggested is that for, for something to be defined as dispatchable technology and used to back up the reliability of the grid, it should be heat safe. And that would exclude plants that you know frequently break down unexpectedly and or have failed in those critical moments of heat waves. Snowy 2.0 will make renewables reliable and will lower future energy prices for consumers. It's an epic project. What about the Coalition's other big investment in securing Australia's energy future? The Snowy Hydro 2.0. Hydro is great. It's dispatchable and it's renewable, so it's a really, really useful form of energy. I guess the issues I would have with it is that it's likely to be a massive engineering project that takes years and years to complete and it's probably unlikely to be cheaper than solar thermal for instance so solar thermal power plants take a couple of years they're modular Um, you roll them out they don't have to go in the middle of often environmentally sensitive alpine areas they can go pretty much anywhere where it's sunny and we're not short of that in australia Um, i haven't you know compared the the economics of snow hydro too with solar thermal in particular, but I'd be amazed if it was uh, a cheaper and more practical option than just building, you know, building out a bunch of modular solar thermal power plants. Um, And then there's a question around the cost of that. It's really interesting that uh, solar thermal in particular has a much lower levelised cost of electricity. It's It's actually much cheaper than gas peaking plants. So, 
given you want this kind of responsive dispatchable energy and you know usually the type of plants that are pointed to are gas peaking plants if you're talking about fossil fuels well solar thermal power is actually cheaper than gas peaking plants so n not only do we have more reliable options available than coal and gas plants for dispatchable energy often they're competitive or cheaper with these coal and gas plants been episode 24 of Follow the Money, the first for the year, recorded on 17th of January 2018 and brought to you by the Australia Institute. You can read the full report by Mark Oag, Can't Stand the Heat, about the failure of gas and coal plants during the heat rave of February 2017 on our website at tai.org.au, where you can also listen to past episodes and read more about our work. Subscribe to Follow the Money on iTunes or wherever you get your favourite podcasts. And if you enjoy it, please leave us a rating on iTunes. It helps to boost the profile of the podcast so others can discover it. We're also on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. This episode was produced by Jennifer Macy. Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum composed our title track and you can find more of his music at pulseandthrum.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.